Even with Joan Jett in the building and the Orioles cruising to a 9-0 win over the Chicago White Sox, you couldn't help but think, how are the O's going to get through this without Felix Bautista? We'll try to answer that coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, August 29th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 9-0 win over the Chicago White Sox on Monday night. Get to the five things you need to know from that one, including another great start from Grayson Rodriguez, a big day from Ryan O'Hearn, and D.L. Hall looking nasty coming out of the Orioles' bullpen, all in front of the Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Joan Jett. Then we'll switch to the Felix Bautista situation. Now, I talked a little bit about it on Monday's episode, but wanted to dive in even deeper here with Felix Bautista going down over the weekend with the UCL injury. Now, we don't know the severity of it, but he is on the IL, and a lot of signs are pointing to he is at least done for this season. So what will the O's do without him? Not just at the closer role, but throughout the rest of the bullpen as they fight for a division title. Try to answer that coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Sleeper. Swing for the fences on Sleeper picks, and you could win up to 100 times your money. Just download the Sleeper app and use promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. So we'll start this one with an Orioles victory. Final score from Oriole Park at Camden Yards on Monday night is the Orioles 9 and the White Sox nothing in game one of a three-game series between the O's and the Southsiders in Baltimore. O's get the win. Rays were off on Monday night until they embark on a quick two-game series in Miami against the Marlins tonight. So with the victory, the Orioles extend their lead to two and a half games in the American League East, and the Orioles clinch a winning record here in 2023 and get to 82 and 49 on the season. But of course, we know they got their sights set much higher than just a winning record this year. But I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the 9-0 win on Monday. And the first thing you need to know is, well, Grayson Rodriguez was awesome once again. This guy has been absolutely dynamite since the Orioles recalled him from AAA. Since he came back up in his eight starts, Rodriguez has a 2.83 ERA. And in this one, he was great once again. Six scoreless innings for Rodriguez allowed just one hit, six strikeouts, and one walk allowed 96 pitches. Through six innings, White Sox had just six hard hit balls against him. And again, just that one hit was a fourth inning double by Luis Robert. Other than that, pretty smooth sailing for Grayson Rodriguez. I got to say, I mean, he just rolled through the White Sox order. He retired 18 of the 20 batters that he faced. Get in, get out, six scoreless. His fourth consecutive start of at least six innings for Rodriguez. And in those last four starts specifically, 25 innings, 18 hits, 6 runs, 21 Ks to just 6 walks. He's just been fantastic. This is the pitcher that we were promised with Rodriguez coming up through the minor league system. And, I mean, the velocity was big time on Monday night, right? I mean, he was averaging 98 and a half. He touched 100.7 miles per hour. I believe that was his hardest thrown pitch of the season when he hit 100.7, basically 101 On Monday night, his average of 98.4, one of his best of the year, he's been averaging 97 throughout the season. All of his velocities were up, change up slider, curveball, all the velos were up on the day for Grayson Rodriguez. 14 whiffs on 53 swings, not a great number, but he got 10 whiffs on the fastball. That was kind of the main pitch through it 55% of the time. And listen, he had pristine fastball command. He had elite velocity on the pitch. So basically him and Adley Rutschman thought, why not? Let's just keep throwing it. He did, and it worked against... To be fair, what has been a very bad White Sox lineup, a team that is now 50 and 82 after the loss on Monday night. Second thing you need to know from this one is that the Orioles took off running 
in this game. Not only did they take some extra bases in some key spots, but also stole some bases. Three stolen bags for the Orioles on the night against the White Sox rookie catcher Corey Lee and their pitching staff of Michael Kopech and Sammy Peralta. But the Orioles did a great job there. Gunnar Henderson stole two bases and Ryan McKenna stole one. And each of them came around to score once in the game. And also each guy's hit the ball pretty well in this game. Henderson went two for four with a couple of singles, a walk and two runs scored. And Ryan McKenna, who got the start in left field, despite the White Sox throwing a right-handed starter out there in Michael Kopech, Austin Hayes did not start. Brandon Hyde said before the game, it's not injury, just wanted to get him a day off. But we did see Hayes limping around a little bit on Saturday and in Sunday's game. So McKenna gets the start against a righty. And listen, he goes one for three, has a two-run single in the eighth, also draws a walk that allowed him to come around and score a run in the fourth when he walked, stole second went to third on a fly ball and then scored on a wild pitch, kind of manufactured that run himself. And we know this Orioles team has some speed. They put it to work on Monday night. Third thing you need to know from the Orioles 9-0 win is that it was another big day for Ryan O'Hearn, who got the start in right field in this one with Hayes out for the day and Santander DHing. They went McKenna in left, Mullins in center, and O'Hearn in right and because it was kind of a blowout, O'Hearn played the entire game out in right field. But he goes two for five with a couple of singles and a couple of RBIs, including the big swing that got things going for the Orioles with the bases loaded and one out in the third inning. He dumped a fastball into left center field for a two-run single to give the O's the lead. He is now back up at 300 with a 300 average and an 840 OPS on the season for the O's, both leading the team. Just what a revelation he has been since coming over from the Kansas City Royals. Fourth thing you need to know from this one is that, man, D.L. Hall was nasty coming out of that Orioles bullpen on Monday night. Now, we saw him Saturday night for his first appearance since being recalled to replace Felix Bautista on the roster, and he threw a scoreless inning, got a big double play, but he got his first strikeout back on Monday night. When an inning and a third scoreless retired all four batters he faced with one strikeout through just 17 pitches and allowed just one hard hit ball. He was throwing the fastball. He was throwing the changeup. He was throwing the slider. It was a good mix from the lefty hall. The velocity on the fastball looked good. It was sitting 96. He was up to 97. But he actually really mixed his pitch as well. 17 pitches, six changeups, five sliders, five fastballs, and one curveball. I thought it was a really good mix for Hall, who got three whiffs on nine swings on the day, one on each of those main offerings. I just like the confidence he showed. He faced a good amount of righties in that inning. It wasn't, you know, like he was facing a patch of lefties. He got to see, you know, three righties out of four batters, and it did not phase him. Just really liked what I saw from Hall. And I've been beating the drum that he's going to be a significant reliever down the stretch for the Orioles this year. With this Felix injury, he might have to be, as we'll talk about in a bit, but that was a good step forward for D.L. Hall. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles win over the White Sox Monday night is that, well, the O's certainly put this game away as they piled on in the eighth inning. Yes, they were kind of commanding this game. You know, they got two in the third, two in the fourth, had a 4 nothing lead for most of the game, but really put things away against Edgar Navarro, who was recalled earlier in the day to the White Sox bullpen. The right-hander did not look good, and the Orioles pounced on him for a five-run eighth inning. I mentioned that Ryan McKenna two-run single that made it 6 nothing. And then Anthony Santander had an incredible at-bat. He fouled off pitch after pitch and then finally got the one that he wanted. Santander then smoked a three-run homer into the flag court to officially put the game away if it wasn't already to make it a 9 nothing game. His team leading 25th homer of the year hit at 99 miles per hour off the bat, 378 feet into right field. Just makes you remember, Santander is such a huge part of this team. He's really been heating up lately, had a bunch of homers over the last week. Just a huge part in the middle of this order. And when you combine the fact that Santander was struggling a bit in August and then missed, you know, four games with that back injury, the Orioles offense struggled then. Since he's come back, they've got more power. They're starting to turn things around a little bit. He really, you know, he's not one of the like young studs on this team, but he is certainly a catalyst in the middle of this order. And he becomes more and more important for the O's as the days go by. But the Orioles get game one of the series, nine nothing once again are not swept. You just do not sweep this team and uh, handling their business against a very bad, very dysfunctional Chicago White Sox team. But even with, you know, all the good vibes of Monday night, right? The Orioles finally get a blowout win. Haven't had many of those this year. Get a shutout. They only allow two hits. Their star rookie, Grayson Rodriguez, getting the job done. Everybody's contributing. They win the game 9-0. Joan Jett 
you know, the famous Orioles fan, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, sitting in the first row, up in the booth with Kevin Brown and Ben McDonald and, and Greg Olson. Great night at the yard. Even with all of that, you can't get it out of the back of your mind. It hasn't been enough time. The Orioles are without Felix Bautista. After suffering the UCL injury in Friday night's game, we still don't know the extent of it, but you got to feel like he's at least done for the season. And even if it's just an extended time this year that he's done for, the O's are in a playoff chase. They're trying to win a division. Heck, they're trying to win a World Series. So what are they going to do now that they have lost the best reliever in baseball? Try to sort it out with my thoughts on the closer role and the loss of Bautista coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Sleeper. Now, do you think that maybe tonight Anthony Santander can go yard again against the White Sox because he's been swinging it well? Well, I do. And on Sleeper, you can swing for the fences with up to 100 times payouts. All you have to do is choose two or more players that you like and select more or less on their stat categories like homers, strikeouts, hits, and more. Get your picks right and you could win big. And Sleeper, it's such an easy app to use. You make the picks, you go on there, you do it incredibly quickly, and you can show that you know ball and get a little money as well. Get some dynamic payouts on Sleeper that come with more stat categories to place contests on. They make it a little more fair for you, and you get higher payouts than other apps with less picks. It's that simple. So use the promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. So the Orioles got the win over the White Sox 9-0 on Monday night. But even when it was a great game for the O's, you know, you can't shake that feeling of losing Felix Bautista. I have, you know, I'd like to know where you're at on kind of the Felix Bautista situation. Sound off in the comments here on YouTube and make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. But I'm almost at acceptance that he's going to be done for the year and potentially longer. I can't fully get there because the O's haven't said yet, like, hey, he's done for the year. They haven't said yet, hey, he's getting Tommy John surgery. You can assume that there's a good chance those things might happen. But here's where we sit with Felix Bautista. Brandon Hyde was asked about it before Monday's game. He said he had no new updates. Felix was in the dugout with the team, but we don't know anything further. Now, we know what has happened so far. Felix Bautista throws a pitch with two strikes and two outs in the ninth on Friday, kind of hangs the arm, wiggles the fingers, comes out of the game. We hear it's going to be an arm injury. Next day, Michael Elias talks to the media, says it is some sort of UCL injury. They do not yet know the severity. But that is troublesome because the UCL, when it fully tears, that is the injury that leads to pitchers to getting Tommy John surgery and missing at least a year after the surgery and the recovery from that injury. So that is what we know right now. Now, you know, Michael Elias, when asked about, hey, could he come back this year? He kind of gave the answer of, you know, look up what a UCL injury does to you. It feels like, and again, this hasn't been confirmed by the Orioles, but it feels like even the best case scenario for Felix Bautista right now is that he misses the rest of this year, he rehabs, he rests, and he's back for 2024. That feels like the absolute best case scenario. I get you know, that they haven't said he's done for the year, but if you know UCL injuries, if you know pitching, that's what it feels like we're heading towards. Now, there's a worse part here where he has to get Tommy John, and if he does... He's going to miss all of 2024 as well. Like he's not going to be back until 2025 if he gets Tommy John surgery. Generally, the surgery takes somewhere between 12 and 18 months for a pitcher to come back. I mean, even at the best, even if he gets Tommy John done in September, there's just no way that he's coming back next year at any point for the O's. But then he'd be fully rested, ready to go for 2025. Now, there's other things that could happen. You know, the kind of best case scenario is. It's a very slight tear. You know, you can rest and recovery throughout the offseason. You can be back next year, try to pitch through it. There is kind of a, a an in-between level of the tear where you can do this newer surgery called an inner brace surgery that actually isn't as invasive. It can only be done for lesser tears. You get the full tear. You pretty much got to get Tommy John. But some pitchers, Rich Hill has gotten at the inner brace surgery. The recovery is only nine months for that one. So if Felix were to get that somewhat soon, he could be back at some point in 2024. But again, the O's do have some time because if they're evaluating, hey, you know, does he need Tommy John surgery? They do have some time to wait. Like they don't have to get the Tommy John surgery tomorrow because whether he gets it today or whether he gets it in December, he'll most likely be back and fully ready to go in spring training of 2025 and will still miss the entirety of 2024. 
So he's got some time here because of the timing of the injury right at the end of a season. You know if you get TJ, you're missing the whole next year. But whether it's now or, hey, you wait, you try to rehab it, see what happens, and then you get it in the winter, you're still most likely going to be able to return to start the 2025 campaign. So that's at least a little silver lining. But again, we haven't gotten anything confirmed, but you got to think at the very least he's done for the year. So what are the O's going to do now, right? Like, it sucks. It really does. There's nowhere to sugarcoat it. Like, not having him the rest of this year, that it hurts the World Series odds. He's not the most important player on the roster, but you could argue behind Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, and Kyle Bradish, he might be the f- fourth most important Oriole right now, number four on the list of guys you don't want to see injured. I get that he's only a reliever, right? And he's not pitching more than, you know, maybe four innings a week at the most. You know, that's less than one start for a pitcher. I understand that for a starting pitcher. But he's also the best reliever in baseball. His strikeout stuff is nasty. He was on pace to set a record for strikeout rate in a season for a relief pitcher. That is invaluable to a bullpen and to a team in general. So it is a big loss. And it does hurt the Orioles World Series odds for 2023. And it hurts their team in general for 2024 that you're not going to have the best closer in baseball. And I get closers are volatile. Sometimes relievers will have bad years. But for what we've seen from Felix over two seasons, you got to think he was going to be at least really good in 2024 as well. But we want to focus on this year because, I mean, you can kind of dread the future and think about, oh my gosh, a full season without Felix Bautista, what are you going to do? But the O's can't even think about that right now because they've definitely, whether he's going to be out for the year or not, they are preparing right now for Felix Bautista to be out for the season. That's at the very least what you feel like is going to happen with any kind of UCL injury, no matter the severity. So now you're looking at, okay, what do they do in the ninth inning? Now we saw them have a save chance Saturday the day after the injury happened. And it was in your Cano who got the save chance in a one run game against the Rockies. Didn't get a strikeout, but got a one, two, three inning locked down his fifth save. And the Orioles won that Saturday game five, four over Colorado. That is where I feel like the Orioles will go to for now is in your Cano. He's gotten five saves already. He's been kind of the number two guy when Felix hasn't been available, but he has, he's gotten the save chances. He just feels like the guy that they're going to go to, at least for now. Now, maybe not in every chance, right? Because if there's like a big pocket of lefties coming up, you could see a, a DL Hall, CNL Perez, a Danny Coulomb, you know, gotten some save chances before, maybe get those chances again. Like back in Philadelphia when Cano and Bautista weren't available, it was Perez who got a save chance. It was Coulomb who came in on Friday after Felix went down to throw that one pitch, get the strikeout, and get the save. And we saw DL Hall get a save chance at the end of last year when Bautista went out with that knee injury. So all those guys have have gotten those chances, but I would think most of them will go to Yinyer Cano, especially because he's pitching really well right now. Like He's not all the way back to how he looked at the beginning of the year, but Cano in August, 11 and two-thirds scoreless hitting, seven hits, just one extra base hit, 12 Ks to one walk and one hit batter. 50% ground ball rate is really good. Again, he's not what he was early in the year when he was at a 70% ground ball rate, which was ridiculous, but 50% is still pretty good. Still a good ground ball pitcher. Now, that's all fine and dandy, right? Like, Yinyer Cano is not Felix Bautista. We all know that. He's not the same pitcher. He doesn't have the same strikeout stuff. He can't, you know, get you out of the zombie runner extra inning situation as easily as Felix can. But he's still been a really good reliever for most of the year. And you feel like, you know, if you have to go into the postseason with him in the closer role, it's not Felix, but it's not terrible. But here's the thing you also have to think about. Like, It's not just about the ninth inning. This is something we talked about last year when the Orioles traded Jorge Lopez at the deadline. Yes, they had Felix Bautista to fill in, and it turned out Bautista was a better closer than Lopez. But it's not just about the closer role. You, yes, are replacing, you know, Lopez with Bautista in the closer role, but on the roster, you're replacing Lopez with, you know, whoever that last guy in the bullpen was last year. And that was kind of a rotating door for a while for the Orioles. Same kind of thing with Felix. Yes, Cano is a downgrade from Felix, but he can still help you. But that last spot in the bullpen is really who is replacing Felix Bautista. And that guy is going to be nowhere close to the production Felix gives you. And it does make your bullpen worse. And it makes the team worse without Felix Bautista. Now, again, World Series odds are going to take a hit. I'm not saying they're done because they're not. This team can still, even without Felix, win a World Series. But it's not just going to take Cano in the ninth inning. It's going to take the full bullpen. Really, everybody's going to have to step up to do their part in filling in, literally, 
Bautista's large shoes. So coming up next to finish off the pod, we'll talk about well, what are the rest of this bullpen going to look like without Bautista? Not just now, but also in September as rosters expand and guys get healthy. How will the O's fill in for that production? We'll answer that to finish off the pod coming up next. So even without Felix Bautista, they really wouldn't have needed him anyway. The Orioles took down the White Sox 9-0 on Monday night in Game 1 of a three-game set. And Game 2 is tonight. The Orioles will go for another series win, trying to win Game 2 in this one here on a Tuesday night at the yard. And it'll be Dean Kramer who gets the ball for the Orioles in this one. Kramer had kind of an up-and-down year, but he's been a little more steady lately. For the Orioles, the 27-year-old righty has a 4.31 ERA in 26 starts this season. Last time out, he was really good against Toronto. Six scoreless innings, five hits, no walks, and five strikeouts for Dean, who's been great in the month of August. He's got a 2.59 ERA in the month and has just been fantastic lately for the Orioles. Now, Dean did not pitch when the Orioles were in Chicago against the White Sox in April. So he'll get their his first look at uh, kind of a bad White Sox team coming up in game two tonight. And the White Sox will go with Jesse Schultens, who came up with the White Sox a couple of months ago, was put in the bullpen, and has since been moved to the starting rotation really since they made their trades at the deadline, trading away Giolito and, and Lance Lynn. Cholton's in 65 innings this year, has a 4.15 ERA. His last two starts have not been good. It was five and two-thirds innings of five-run ball against the A's and three innings of five-run ball against the Rockies. Two of the worst teams in baseball, and they each put up five runs against Jesse Schultons, the right-hander. Hopefully, O's can do the same tonight. And you can catch every single pitch of the Orioles' hometown radio broadcast of Game two between the O's and the Sox on the SXM app through Sirius XM. Just download the app and search Orioles. But either way tonight, if it becomes a safe situation, as we know, the Orioles will not have Felix Bautista with him out with that UCL injury. We don't know the severity yet, but again, you got to prepare for the worst and definitely not having him for the rest of the year. So talked a bit about what the closer role could look like without Bautista, right? You feel like, Yinyer Cano is going to get most of those chances. And some of the other guys, you know, if there's a big pocket of lefties, could get the chances as well. But you got to feel like, and, and Hyde hasn't said this yet, but most likely it's going to be most of Cano's chances. But it's not just about the closer role. It's about how the rest of the bullpen steps up. Because even though Cano is good, he is not Felix Bautista. And other guys are going to have to perform at a higher level to keep the bullpen at the level it was when they had Felix Bautista, the best reliever in all of baseball, full stop. So let's start with kind of what the high leverage guys look like at this point. Besides Cano, who I'd throw into the closer role, at least for now. I feel like Seattle Perez, Danny Coulomb, and Jacob Webb are kind of your main high leverage guys at the moment, which is really an interesting thing if you would have heard that about a month ago when Perez couldn't get anybody out, Coulomb was solid, and Webb was on the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. But those guys have been good, right? Another scoreless appearance for Webb on Monday, even after he got hit by a line drive. He got him, seemed like in the flesh, he seemed like he was good. He stayed in the game, rolled a double play ball. CNL Perez has not given up a run in August. He's been great. Danny Coulomb was, you know, on the IL with a little bicep injury, but has come back and had two strong outings since then. And I trust those guys in those roles. Then you've got some guys who maybe I would consider they're in middle relief right now, but I could see them easily getting a high leverage role. Those two guys would be Shintaro Fujinami and D.L. Hall. They kind of fall into the same spot because they both have electric stuff, one from the right side, one from the left side, but each of them have their command issues and, you know, it can get away from them a little bit at times. However, Fujinami has pitched and has had some success in high leverage this year for the O's. And already we've seen Hall pitch the seventh and eighth innings of close games in his first two outings for the Orioles. So they're already ready to trust him in that role. And listen, he pitched in some high leverage spots last year. So he's done it before. And if you kind of look at this group, right, you've got Cano in the the closer spot, but between Perez and Coulomb and Jacob Webb, who've all had save chances and converted them even this year, Fujinami's had one, Hall did it last year. You've got some guys who have done it. And then, of course, Austin Both right now is on the team. He's in your long relief role. And 
who knows how long he'll be in that role. I think the Orioles are kind of okay with DFAing him if they have to, but in his first outing back, he throws two scoreless innings on Sunday. So he's helping your bullpen right now as well, even just in that long roll. Now, they've got some reinforcements coming, right? I mean, first of all, you're going to add at least one pitcher. With the September call-ups coming on Friday, the Orioles would get to add at least one arm. Really, I would say they have three candidates right now. It's either Tyler Wells, Brian Baker, or Mike Bauman at this point, because D.L. Hall's already here replacing Bautista. So one of these guys is going to come back on Friday. We'll get to John Means in a second. It most likely will not be him. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, who they would go with. Now, each of them has been given a save chance within the last three seasons. Tyler Wells was kind of the Orioles' closer by the end of 2021 when he pitched out of the bullpen that year for the O's in his rookie season. Brian Baker's been given some of those chances just when other guys have been down or injured or whatever it may be over the past two years. And we saw Mike Bauman get one of those chances in Seattle a couple, couple of weeks ago. Did not go well, but the Orioles at least trusted him in that spot a little bit. And it could be one of the three guys. Now, I know a lot of people are calling for Tyler Wells at the moment, and I don't really, I, I can't get on board with just saying right now, yeah, just bring up Tyler Wells and put him in the closer role. He clearly showed fatigue this year, which is why he was sent down to double-A Bowie and is now in triple-A Norfolk as a reliever. He is still trying to build himself back up. His velocity is not there as a reliever. Like his velocity right now as a reliever in AAA is kind of the same as it was as a starter this year. You would like that velo to get closer to what it was as a reliever in 21 and get higher. It hasn't done that yet. And also, it's been two years since he was a relief pitcher in that closer role. And remember, he was in the closer role. I get it, but he was in the closer role for a terrible 2021 Orioles team that lost 110 games and finished with the worst record in baseball. That's a little different than just calling him up and popping him in the closer role for a team trying to hold on to a division lead in September. Those are very, very different things. And even if somehow Tyler Wells would get back into the closer role at some point this season, it is certainly not going to be right when they would call him back up if they did so in September. They would at least ease him in with some lower leverage roles. So I don't really understand the call for like, Wells for closer, Wells for closer. It's not that simple. You got way better options currently on the roster. And listen, there's no guarantee that Tyler Wells is going to be the September call-up on Friday. Now, he could come up at some point, and I do think he will join the Orioles' bullpen at some point in September. But if I had to guess right now, I think Brian Baker might come back up, at least for now, on Friday. Baker, since they sent him down to AAA basically at the beginning of August, He's been pretty good. Seven innings, three runs, five hits, 10 Ks, three walks, and a homer. He found the feel for his changeup, which is his best pitch. He didn't have it for like six weeks to two months in the majors. That's why he was bad. They set him down. He's found the command of that pitch again. And in his last three outings in AAA Norfolk, he hasn't allowed a base runner, and he struck out four. He's looking much better. The velo is good. The changeup command is good. That's what you need to see from Brian Baker. And listen... I understand the hate for Brian Baker. He's had some tough stretches, but he's also been dominant at stretches for the Orioles. And if you look at this O's bullpen right now, and you're thinking just on pure stuff, you could make an argument that just on pure stuff, you're looking at DL Hall number one, and you could maybe say Brian Baker's number two. That's how good that fastball changeup combination can be when it's on. He's got incredible stuff plus numbers. It can happen if he finds the command. I believe in Brian Baker. I know a lot of you don't, but you're kind of focusing too much on a bad stretch this year. He was really good last year at times. He was really good this year at times. He can do that again. And if Brian Baker you know, is your last or second to last guy in the bullpen, in the extended bullpen with the September call-ups, you can do that for a while. That allows you, if you call up Brian Baker, who's been in the bullpen for two years, and you, if he's got the command back, you kind of know what you're going to get out of him as a middle reliever, then... You can wait a little bit and see if Mike Bauman can, you know, regain his form. He's only made one relief appearance so far since being sent back down to AAA. It was scoreless, but he's got a ways to go till he comes back. You can give Tyler Wells a few more opportunities. You know, he's only pitched a couple of times in relief in Norfolk. You'd like to see it a little bit more to see what he can do before you just give him a big role in the big league bullpen. So you give Wells a little more time. And you give John Means some more time because, listen, John Means I don't think is ready quite yet. Like, he made another rehab start. This one was up in AAA Norfolk on Friday. Four and a third innings, four runs, or four hits, excuse me, one run. Two Ks, two walks, a homer, a hit batter. 
72 pitches was his highest since he started his rehab, 42 strikes. Fastball was averaging 90.8 miles per hour. It was up to 92.5. He was more so a 93-94 guy the last time we saw him on a big league mound early in 2022. So he's still got a little bit of a ways to go to get that velocity back, and you don't know if he'll fully get it back at least this year coming off Tommy John. Now, six whiffs total in 72 pitches wasn't great on Friday night. He did get a lot of soft contact, which is kind of vintage John Means. Went mostly, you know, fastball changeup, as we're known to see from Means as well in that start in Norfolk Friday night. The way the Orioles are building him up, it seems to me like they're building up Means to be a starter or at the very least like a long reliever swing guy in the Oriole bullpen. And the fact that they keep building him up with more and more pitches, he's going to throw, I would think, at least one more rehab start in AAA, try to get over 80 pitches. And then the O's will kind of reevaluate after that. Okay, what can they do? Now, that rehab start will come at some point this week in Norfolk, which means he wouldn't even be ready to be called up by Friday, but it could be shortly after that. And maybe if Austin both pitches again, has a bad outing, you just DFA him and means take takes both spot on the roster. That could certainly happen. But I do kind of see, you know, a Brian Baker, a Mike Bauman still helping you. A Tyler Wells helping you at some point, And a John Means can help you as well. So they're going to have help in this bullpen. It's just about guys do really need to step up because it's going to be incredibly hard, especially for one player. There's no one player out there that that can replace Felix Bautista's production. But maybe if multiple guys, some who are already here, some who are in AAA, step up in the big leagues in September, they can get themselves to the playoffs and have a good enough bullpen to get through the playoffs and hopefully try and bring home a title this year season. But that'll do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I mentioned it yesterday. I'll mention it again now. No episode coming up tomorrow. I will be out in the mountains. No recording happening for a Wednesday pod. I will be back, however, on Thursday recapping game two and game three from this Orioles and White Sox series. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, Every day.